I came thinking that I would tell you about many things, about how to succeed, about how to be um, a better business person, how to be, um, just to be a better person in general in your future. But I don't think that I have the capability nor the um, know-how to give you that such a lofty, large advice. All I can tell you is that life is a journey. And perhaps the only thing that I can share with you is my own. I believe in one thing and one thing only, that impossible is nothing. To start off, let me explain to you where we are today, and then I want to tell you how we got there. Today, and I say this with humility, and I'm sure that you won't understand that this is humility, but it is, um, HSY is one of the most recognized brands in this country. Um, we show not only in Pakistan, but we show in cities like Paris, London, New York, Milan. We um, are recognized as a brand, not just in the local industries, but in far, far away places like Tokyo and Singapore, we are now asked to stock our clothes. It's wonderful. But this is not how it began. And my journey is something that I hope that I can share with you. I usually don't share these things, but I think that it is important because you truly are, you guys in this very room, perhaps will be our future, a future of our country. And a lot of people think that it takes um, it takes money, or it takes uh, certain luck, or it takes something extra to be successful, or to be able to do something. And I believe that all it takes is really perseverance and hard work. I started off as, um, I started off m much younger than I actually ever wanted to work. I come from a single parent family. My mom um, bought me up. I grew up outside the country in the United States of America. And being a, a child of a single parent is not the easiest thing in the world. You are the only son. You're expected to be a successful lawyer, businessman. My father is a um, politician, so I guess maybe that's where I was supposed to go. I always had a little keen understanding and liking for speaking. President of my debates team, president of my dramatics team. Failure was not an option. Never was. But that's not, that's not the story. The story is this, that how I got into fashion. In 1994, something that a lot of people don't know, I met with a car accident. And this car accident, um, we were, I was in Lacoste. Are you all familiar with Lacoste? I was in Lacoste and I was coming back and it was a fantastic day. We were in a, a, a musical, Theatre Bra in Otathon Zamane. I think it's coming back now, thanks to Nita and Karachi. And I was coming back from uh, getting food from Bhaiyeke Kebab. Do you remember where that is in Model Town? <laughs> We were getting some pegi kebab, and all of us friends were in a car, and we were driving back to school. And we were opening the kebabs, and of course the steam was coming out, and it was very, uh, it was raining outside, and kebabs inside, so obviously everything was all steamed up, and the car's window shields got all fogged up. In that time when it got fogged up, I guess my friend who was driving the car couldn't see where he was going, and we swerved off the road and hit something, and I flew right outside the windscreen onto the road. Unfortunately for me, the car had already had an accident a couple of weeks before, and the driver had perhaps pocketed the money and put a cheap screen in. So the screen became all jagged edged, and the jagged edges went in my face, in my eyes, and I lost my eyesight and became blind for a year. Being blind is not the easiest thing to go through. It actually alienates you and makes you understand and realize and appreciate, or perhaps le appreciate less the other keen, interesting things that you did not feel before. The worst thing is the sense of hearing. If you close your eyes and keep them closed for about two minutes and try to hear the sounds around you, they become very, very acute, very loud, sometimes too loud. You can hear your mother crying, your doctor saying something to your cousin four doors down, he's not going to be able to see. You can hear a chipkali walk across above your head, across, and it feels like it's crawling on top of you. It's incredibly alienating. However, as luck would have it, and God has been very kind to me, I did get my sight back because my family was uh, working with some research hospitals in London, and I gave myself as a guinea pig to be operated on. When I got myself operated, I think it was 16 surgeries. Aisha was a friend of mine at that time as well. 
I got my sight back. And I remember the first thing that I ever saw. The first thing I ever saw was my best friend. She was standing in front of me, and, and she was wearing red. I couldn't see anything. The only thing I could see was a little bit of color. I'm sorry, am I supposed to stay in my spot? <laughs> Can I take my spot with me? <laughs> I saw the first color, red. It's funny how red keeps popping back in my life as well. For me, it was the color of life. For me, it was what I would cherish and what I would think that would mean everything to me for the rest of my life. Then small other things started happening. I would eat a bite of food of a spoon. And could you imagine when you take a bite of a spoon, we don't appreciate it, but imagine looking down at that spoon and when you take that bite and light falls on that silver and it just shines, you just feel like, oh my God, this has to be the most beautiful thing. I mean, how could I have not missed this in my life? You appreciate the smaller, smaller, finest things in life. Anyway, got my sight back. Don't want to bore you with that. Um, and at that time, I spoke to my mother. Um, I, like I told you, she's the one who's brought me up. She's the most amazing woman I've ever met in my life, as I'm sure everyone's mother is. Uh, I think uh, women make this world go around, and perhaps we don't give them enough attention, enough uh, notice, enough importance, and we should. She was incredibly understanding when I told her that, Mom, I think I've given this life back. I think I've give, been given this chance to be able to be something more because I'm here for a reason. And I have a reason, and the reason is that I really want to make things of beauty. I want to make things that make my life beautiful, other people's life beautiful. And I told her that I don't want to be a lawyer. <gasps> Shock. Um, or a politician. Um, so I'm thinking about that now. Uh, <laughs> um, and she was very kind, and she let me. And she said, you know what? If you're going to do it, and if you're, going to be a uh, if you're going to be a fashion designer, or in fashion, or anything like that, you have to get an education. Without education, nothing is, it's impossible. So I said, fine, I will. I got into school. It was the Pakistan Institute of Fashion Design. At that time, it was called the Pakistan School of Fashion Design. It was an expensive school, mind you. It was an expensive school, for especially someone like myself, whose mother was a teacher. She was making ends meet, and we had just come out of an accident, and life was not so easy. I got four jobs, four. One for each day of the week, except two days, which I had to work, and at that time, you could not work. I used to, and I know you're not gonna believe me, but it's true, I used to work at a contractor in Main Market. You know where you guys get the guys who pick up the stuff in the wagons, where, I'm sure you don't even know that, but you know, guys, can, you can go and get people who can actually physically, physically pick up stuff. So I became a painter. In the evening, from 6 to 8 or 10, I would paint people's homes. Um, my second job was that I would help people with their electronics, though I knew nothing about electronics. If you ask me how this computer works, I'll have no clue. But I spoke to someone and I said, you know, you can tell me and I can set up your electronics and your sound system because I have a really keen hearing sense. Third was there was a store called Pace that had just opened, and they were looking for visual merchandisers. I didn't know a thing about visual merchandising, but I went and convinced them that I could help them set up their store. And fourth was I used to design bags. Now, this, this bag business was the most difficult because this job was in Islamabad. So I would finish school at 6, run to the debut station, take a debut to Islamabad, go and work there, work the night shift, finish at 6 in the morning, take the debut back to get to school by 11 o'clock by my first assignment, and be in school without sleep. This went on for four years. I graduated at the top of my class. <laughs> and I have, thank you for your applause, but my, my reason for truly telling you that is, like I said, impossible is nothing. When I say that my label is recognized and I say that my label is understood or wanted or bought and people respect me is the next thing. The worst part was that I did start working in school and not only did I start working, I also started working and dabbling in choreography. It was new, fashion shows were happening, there was a new business erupting, there were new people like Uther and Shazad and Amina Haq and Vanessa Ahmed and fashion shows and new sponsors and people thinking, wait a second, sport's not the only way to go, fashion is the way to go and people wanted to do new events and there was new blood required, everything was happening in Karachi, everyone in Karachi had really fun, funky accents and were very cool and you know, us Lahodis were like, you know, yeah, what's going on and you know, there was this, uh, 
There was this one guy with like an American twang accent and you know, like all like super fly, or at least he thought. Um, so I got into fashion choreography and I started directing shows. Before I knew it, I was, I was the youngest choreographer at that time. I was even written up in um, Greece. I remember I'd gone to Greece. Now you have to understand, going to Greece for me was a big deal. I had not really left Lahore for a very long time. But I was traveling the world and it was fantastic. Uh, I was doing shows in London or in, in, I did shows in Paris. I, uh, Mumbai, which was amazing, um, all of these really wonderful places, and still going to school, and still studying. So I graduated, and what happened? The very thing that I wanted to work towards actually worked against me. And when I found out that I graduated top of my class, I went to every single designer that I'd worked at, everyone that I'd been so very fond of, you know, S and, well, I don't want to take names, X, Y, Z, Mr. How are you? How are you? You know how Lahori people are. We're very polite. We're all very humble. No one took me seriously. Actually, quite the opposite. No one wanted to work with me. Everyone said, you know what? No, you've, you've done too much. Or no, you're not serious enough. No, you've had too many jobs. No, you've not stuck around to one thing for too long. No, I don't think you have the money. That was the one thing I heard over and over again. You don't have the money. And I didn't have the money. I graduated. And I had 2,500 rupees in my account. 2,500 rupees. No one would work with me. No one would hire me. I wouldn't even get a job for 10,000 rupees. After putting myself through school, I was like, how can this be? But then I thought of something. Impossible is nothing. So I had this old sewing machine that my mom used to use. It was a rocket machine. Do you remember those? That's all I had. My mom had that, I used to work, use that at home for my assignments when I used to design and do different stuff. So I was like, is this collection that he wali? So I took the 2,000 out of the 2,500 and went to an Arkali and got a motor in it, one of those pedal motors, got that attached to it. And for 500, I bought some threads, rulers, markers, um, some paper, but didn't have money for fabric. So I said, that's fine, not a big deal. No one's going to hire me. I'm going to become a designer. I'm going to become HSY. That's it. If I fail, I fail, but I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it on my own. So with those 2,500 rupees, I got off with all of these things, came to, came to my house, didn't have a cutting table, so threw my mattress off my bed, and cut off my mom's sheets and her curtains and whatnot, and I made five outfits, five. At that time, there was a new girl who was coming into modeling, a good friend of mine, who really wanted to be a star, who wanted to be something bigger, who really wanted to really reach out and be something amazing. And she also believed, just like me, that impossible is nothing. And she was nobody. And her name was Iman Ali. Um, so I called her. And I said, Iman, um, we can do this. Let's do something together. Let's do so. She said, yeah, what, do we, what should we do? And I said, Ayar, I know these two guys. They're friends of my sisters. They're Athar and Shazad. And um, I don't know if they'll um, do anything for us, but let's call them up. So I called them, and I said, listen, I don't have any money. I don't actually have any clothes. I'm going to cut up some sheets and stuff, and I'm going to come up with five, six outfits. Do you think we could do something? And they were very sweet. They said, yeah, Chalo, let's see what you do. Who's, let, let's get BB. There was BB, Alia, Alia, and um, Zoella. You remember these models? They were old-time models, but there was no Iman Ali. Veniza. So I said, no, we've got this new fantastic girl called Iman, and we want to work with her. Ooh, I only have three minutes left. I just got warmed up. Um, <laughs> anyway, we did the shoot with these five outfits. No clothes, nothing. I had nothing to back this up. And we, um, I sent it to every single magazine editor that I knew. It was a really funky shoot, by the way, let me tell you. It was really nice. Um, or maybe I thought it was really funky, but perhaps it wasn't so funky. <laughs> But I got the cover of five magazines in one single month. Five magazines. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. I started off with one single employee with 2,500 rupees. With that single employee, I started HSY, and I gave him his first check with a ripped up note in it, or with a pencil, because I didn't have a pen, and I still have that pencil, and I keep it with me all the time, and it said, I owe you. And he asked me, what does this I owe you mean? And I said, I owe you money. I don't have money. First month, I think I sold my mom's television. Third, second month, I think I probably sold my own television and uh, uh, whatever else I had. Third month, I sold something else. Fourth month, I hired 70 more people. Today, 
2,500 rupees. We are zinc single debt, zero debt, never taken a penny from anyone, never taken a loan from anyone. HSY now hires 450 people just with 2,500 rupees. And that goes to show that impossible truly is nothing. <laughs> Keeping this spirit alive of impossible is nothing. I'm doing a f and I've been doing this for 20 years. I started working in 1994, and it's been 20 years now. Um, we've started to work on a new project. It's called um, Giving is the New Achieving. When a country like Pakistan, which we tend to sometimes not love as much as we should, as much as we should, sometimes not respect as much as we should. This is our home. Um, this country has given me everything. Though I did not grow up in Pakistan, and sometimes I do regret it because I feel that this was a country that I should have grown up in. This is the country that I should have been a part of, and I really want to be a part of it now. We've um, started a new project called the Share Project, and it's not called Share because of Sheru, as many people think. It is because we decided to adopt a village. Um, and keeping the whole concept of impossible is nothing. I think that if we, as people of Pakistan, you as people of Pakistan, you're the future, you're going to be taking over banks, and I'm probably going to come up to knock on your door when I want to expand, so be nice to me. Um, we have to save this country now. We, this country has saved us, and it's time for us to save this country. I've decided to take a village. Um, we've adopted a village 120 kilometers outside of Lahore. It's called Shirdgar. Um, there is a school there that I have now started a scholarship for young girls. Like I said, I think women are truly our share of our nation. They are our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, and we must take care of them. And so we've taken a scholarship, and under my mother's name, the very woman who brought me up, now other girls go to school with Rehana Mahmood Ali's name, and they educate themselves. We have um, gotten property, and we're planning to open a dispensary there for their uh, health. And besides that, we're empowering them with jobs. HSY has just started a new working station there where we are bringing in embroiders and we're bringing in teachers to come and help them understand and learn embroidery. And so they can empower themselves. They can earn their money and they don't necessarily have to wait for a handout. They have the power to be able to take care of their family and take care of the family's health and most importantly, their education. So I end on this note. You don't need anything but yourself and the education that you have. And hopefully with work, work and a whole lot of work, you can succeed and be HSY and so much more. Because at the end of the day, impossible is nothing. Thank you.